we present Bernard Horsfall as Harry Lawson and Jeffrey Banks as Professor von Hartwig in A Journey to the Center of the Earth, the novel by Jules Verne, adapted to radio in eight parts by Howard Jones. Part seven, The Mysterious Dagger. No doubt you will recall much of what I have told you already at our earlier meetings. But in case you have forgotten, let me remind you that my name is Harry Lawson and that my uncle is that famous, learned, eccentric gentleman, Professor von Hardwig of Hamburg. It seems only yesterday that my uncle brought to his house in the Königstrasse a book in which I discovered an ancient parchment covered with runic characters. It had been written by a certain Arne Sacknesson, an Icelandic alchemist of the 16th century, who claimed to have made a journey to the center of the earth. My uncle insisted that we followed in the footsteps of this great man. So he and I and our faithful guide, Hans Bjorka, descended the crater of Snæfels, an extinct volcano in Iceland, and found ourselves in a maze of subterranean passages and caverns. There we all but died of thirst, and there I was lost in impenetrable darkness and for a little while became demented. Later, we sailed on a raft over a mighty sea, the Central Sea, the professor named it. We witnessed a battle to the death between prehistoric monsters and then were overwhelmed by a fearful hurricane. It was the ever-faithful Hans who saved our lives when we were tossed up on some rocks. Where were we? That was the question we had to decide. My uncle consulted the compass. Oh... No, no. The needle is pointing to the shore. The shore is north. The sea is south. Do you realize what this means? Yes. There must have been a slant of wind during the storm. We've been carried back to the shores of Port Gretchen. The shores we left, apparently forever, so many days ago. Every hour, every minute on the raft has been so much time lost. So, so, fate plays me this vile text. Air, fire, water, all combined against me. Well, now they shall learn what the will of a determined man can do. I will not yield. I will not retreat one inch. We shall see who is going to triumph in this immortal contest. Man or nature. Forward. Forward, I say, to the center of the earth. Uncle, listen to me. To the raft. To the raft. We sail again. Listen to reason. Mm, what is it, Harry? Uncle, there must be some limit to our ambition. We can't achieve the impossible. You know as well as I do that we are quite unready for another sea voyage. It's absolute madness to contemplate a second voyage. A 500 leagues on a wretched pile of beams? With another bedsheet for a sail, a stick for a mast, and probably a tempest to contend with? We can't steer our raft adequately, so we shall be at the mercy of any foul weather we run up against. I tell you, Uncle... It's an act of sheer lunacy to take risks for a second time on this treacherous sea. Hmm. What do you say? You've not heard a single word I've been saying. No, I have not, Harry. Come. Come to the raft. This time, Uncle, you must listen. You must hear me. The raft isn't even seaworthy. Then we must make it seaworthy again. I will insert Hans. <sighs> if you say so. It's going to take time to repair. They have plenty of cordage. It will take hands, no time at all. Yes. Yes. We shall see who is going to try it. Man or nature. Such was the result of my attempts to overcome the professor's stubborn will. I tried again. I begged, I implored him. But all to no purpose. Meanwhile, Hans set about repairing the raft, and before long he had raised a new mast and a new sail which snapped merrily in the breeze. The professor spoke a few words to Hans, who nodded calmly and immediately began to stow our baggage on board and to prepare for our departure. In a mood of stolid and sullen resignation, I was ready 
to board the raft. When my uncle put his hand on my shoulder. There's no hurry, my boy. We shall not embark until tomorrow. Now, since fate has cast us cruelly back on these shores, I think we should not leave them without making a thorough inspection of them. Very well, uncle. Let us set out on another journey of discovery. That is the spirit. We can leave Hans here. He has quite enough to get on with. I imagine Port Gregson to lie somewhere to the west of this place. These shores, in fact, are new to us. There should be a lot to interest us here. The distance between the high watermark on the foreshore and the foot of the rocks was considerable. As we trudged along, our feet crushed innumerable shells of every shape and size. Shells that had been the homes of animals in the early period of creation. I particularly noticed some truly enormous shells, carapaces of turtles and tortoises, more than 15 feet in diameter. For a full mile, we followed the curvings of the central sea, advancing sometimes with great difficulty over broken masses of granite mixed with flint quartz and alluvial deposits. Suddenly, my uncle stopped. It is a cemetery. It is bones. Bones. All bones. On that spot, some three square miles in extent, was accumulated the whole history of animal life. When we moved, our feet crushed with a dry, cracking sound the remains of countless prehistoric fossils. I was quite bewildered. And my uncle, for his part, stood with his arms raised towards the granite vault which served us for a sky. His mouth wide open, his eyes gleaming behind his spectacles. For some minutes, he stood thus, literally agape at the magnitude of this discovery. And then suddenly he darted forward, caught up an object and cried in excitement. Holy! You see what this is? A human skull! It was, indeed, a human skull. Perfectly recognizable. Had the peculiar nature of the soil preserved it through countless ages? I couldn't say. Nor for that matter could my uncle. But this head, with its tight stretched and parchment-like skin, with the teeth whole, the hair abundant, was before our eyes, almost as if in life. Soon we found more human skulls, and then complete skeletons. My uncle could scarcely believe his eyes. Oh, is it not marvelous to contemplate? <laughs> And does it not raise a great question? Were these human bodies dragged down to these steps by some convulsion of nature? Or did they exist here below? Were they born? Did they live? Did they die here as we are born, live and die on the surface of the earth? <laughs> now, what is the answer to that, my boy? I don't know, Uncle. But one thing strikes me. Hmm? What strikes you? Come on now, out with it. Are any men of this ancient race still alive? Are they still wandering about on the shores of this subterranean sea? A very good question. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? It may not be a laughing matter, Uncle. If there are men still here, how are they going to receive us? Another good question. I will guess my mind to it. Meanwhile, let us explore further. For a long and weary hour, we tramped over the great bed of bones. Presently, the shores of the central sea were lost behind hills. These hills and the rocks and what appeared to be far-off forests all had a weird and mysterious aspect under the steady glare of some form of electric illumination. The imprudent and enthusiastic professor, who did not care whether he lost himself or not, hurried me forward. And after about a mile, we came to the edge of a vast forest. Here stood huge palms. Yonder were pines, yews, and cypresses, all seemingly bound together by a carpet of creeping plants. 
The professor was in ecstasies. Do you observe? Do you recognize? Do you realize this is an immense forest of the tertiary period, growing as it grew in days of old? <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Look at those superb palmatitis. A genus of fossil palms of the Carboniferous. Magnificent. Truly magnificent. And over here, see, see trees that a modern child might recognize. Oak, poplar, Norwegian pine. And that surely is an Australian eucalyptus. And there's a New Zealand kauri. Uncle! Come along, don't let us dawdle. There's still so much to see. Here, a common maple. But did you ever see a maple of such gigantic proportions? What's that? I cannot hear anything. Do come along now. Elephants. Living elephants. Look. A great herd of them. No, not elephants. Not our modern elephants, dear boy. Mastodons. Mammoths. Alive and thriving, eating the foliage of this great forest. Marvelous. Come, we must take a closer look of them. Stop. If those beasts stampede, what chance shall we have? No human creature could possibly withstand. No human creature, did you say? You're mistaken, my dear boy. Look yonder. There is a human being, I. A man like ourselves. I looked. Not more than a quarter of a mile off, leaning against the trunk of an enormous tree, was a human being. A Proteus of the underworld, a new son of Neptune, tending this great herd of mastodons. His height I judged to be above twelve feet. His head, as big as that of a buffalo, was lost in a mane of matted hair. And in his hand, he held the branch of a tree, serving him as a shepherd's crook. For some minutes, we neither moved nor spoke. And then I realized that if this giant but turned his head, he might very easily see us. Panic seized me. Grasping my uncle by the arm, I dragged him back. And for the first time, he did not resist me. Hey, stop. Stop it. He can run no further. Yes, I, I think we're safe here. Sit down. Get our breath back. Thank you. Thank you, my boy. Yes, it's better. I am reminded of a phrase in the Latin. Imanis pecoris custos, imanis ipse. The keeper of gigantic cattle, himself a giant. Precisely. What a man! What power, what strength! I just don't believe it. You don't believe it? You don't believe the evidence of your senses? Of your own eyes? The giant was real enough, I grant you, Uncle, but I don't believe he was a man like us. Not homo sapiens. Oh. It stands to reason that no generation of men such as we are can inhabit this subterranean world. Why not? Why not, please? Because if they did, they would all know about us who live on the surface. They would have communicated with us. Possibly. But that was a, a man-like creature, but it wasn't a man. A, a gigantic monkey of some sort. Hmm. I will think over your views and opinions. <sighs> and now that I am quite recovered, my boy... Let us continue with our exploration. We made our way towards the Central Sea. Though this was new territory to us, I noticed every now and then certain rocks which in shape and formation reminded me forcibly of the rocks at Port Gretchen. There were also streams and cascades tumbling from above the rocks, and this seemed to confirm the puzzling compass reading and our extraordinary and involuntary return to the north shore of the Central Sea. Then as we pushed on, the unrecognized appearance of a stream or the profile of a rock threw me into doubt. I said, have we ever come this way before, Uncle? I'm just wondering this myself. I wish I could be sure. Well, we were not cast ashore exactly at the spot we sailed from. That's quite certain. I think the storm must have driven us above our starting point. Therefore, if we follow this coast, we shall come to Port Gretchen. Mm. 
In that case, it is useless to continue our exploration. The best thing we can do is to return to Hans and the raft. Yeah. Are you quite sure of our bearings? Well, not quite sure, Uncle. These rocks are so much alike. All the same, I seem to recognize this cape as the place where Hans built our raft. I fancy we must be very close to Port Gretchen, even if we haven't reached it already. My dear Harry, if this were Port Gretchen, we should find traces of our footsteps, or at least some signs that we have been here. But there's nothing. Nothing. Just a moment. I can see something. Yes, I was right after all, Uncle. And what have you found? Oh, the rusty old dagger. Why did you bring that thing with you? That's no good, no good at all. I've never set eyes on it before. Isn't it yours? Mine? I don't recognize it at all. I'm sure it was never mine. That's very puzzling. Not in the least. The explanation is simple. Icelanders like these old Russian weapons. Obviously, this knife belongs to Hans. He must have dropped it without knowing. No, Uncle. This doesn't belong to Hans. I know him and his habits too well. Hmm? Could it... Could it be the weapon of some ancient warrior? Or of some living creature? Like that gigantic shepherd with his mastodons? And yet, such a creature, if he carried a knife at all, would be armed with a stone knife. Flint, or just possibly bronze. But this knife is steel. Steel, I tell you. Steel, certainly. But uh, calm yourself, Harry. This weapon is a true dagger, such as was carried by gentlemen in their belts during the 16th century. Clearly, this one is of Spanish workmanship. It does not belong to you or to me or to our worthy hands. Not to any living creature in the interior of the earth. Then look closer, my boy. The blade was never blunted like this with fair wear and tear. No. Observe now. It is thick with rust. And this rust is not merely a day old, not a year old, not even a century old. But, Uncle... <laughs> listen, listen, I see. We are now on the verge of a great discovery. This dagger, a wonderful and fortunate find, my boy has lain on the sands of this shore for more than a hundred years. More than two hundred. More than three hundred years. And it was used, or so I firmly believe, by someone endeavoring to carve an inscription on these rocks. Well, if your theory is right, someone brought the knife here. Someone used it here. In a word, somebody has been here before us. Yes, Harry, yes. Now you know the importance of your find. A man has been here before us. A man who has tried once more to indicate the right road to the center of the earth. Let us work around. Let us see what we can find. Forward. Forward. We walked along the wall of rock, looking into every tiny fissure which might widen out and prove to be the road to the center of the earth. Presently we reached a spot where the beach narrowed and the sea almost lapped the base of the rocks, which here were very steep. At last, beneath a huge overhanging rock, we discovered the entrance of a dark and gloomy tunnel. And here, on a tablet of granite, which had been smoothed by rubbing it with another stone, we could see two mysterious and much-worn letters, the initials of the bold and extraordinary traveler who had preceded us on our great adventure. A. S. I was right. I was right. Arne Sacknessen. Always the great Arne Sacknessen. Since the start of our journey, I had experienced many surprises and suffered many disappointments. Indeed, I believe that I was hardened against all further surprises that I would neither see nor hear anything to astonish me again. When, however, I saw those two letters carved in the rock, when I held in my hands the very dagger which had carved them more than 300 years before, I was struck dumb with wonder. My uncle, on the other hand, was seized with a sort of poetical ecstasy. Sacknessem. You great and glorious genius. You have left no stone unturned to show other men the road to the center of this mighty globe. Your fellow creatures can now follow the trail made by your illustrious footsteps 300 years ago. Your name 
cast at every important stage of your journey leads the hopeful traveler direct to the great discovery to which you devoted such energy and courage. And doubtless, the audacious traveler who follows your footsteps to their destination will find the same initials carved at the very center of the earth. I will be that audacious traveler. I too will carve my name on the same spot. But in justice to your devotion, to your courage, and to your being the first man to indicate this road, let this cape, seen first by you on the shores of the sea discovered by you, let this cape be known for all time as Cape Sackmissen. I confess I was roused to a pitch of wild enthusiasm by my uncle's stirring words. What another man had done in ages past could, I felt, be done again. And I was determined to do it myself. Forward. Forward, I cried, using the professor's watchword. And I started in the direction of the somber gallery, the road we had to take. Stop, boy, stop. Let us not lose our heads in this wonderful moment. Before anything else, we should return to our good friend Hans, and then we can bring the raft round to this point. Oh, very well. But don't let's waste time, Uncle. Come along. When you come to think of it, everything has worked out for the best, Uncle. Not quite so fast, please. All for the best, Harry. So, you should begin to realize that now. Yes, Uncle. Even that fearful hurricane was our friend. It put us on the right road. I agree. There is something... Providential in the way they were blown back here. And to make the great discovery of Cape Sackness, it's almost beyond belief. <laughs> I beg you not to go quite so fast, Harry. It's only that I'm anxious not to waste time, Uncle. I can see exactly how things are working out for us. We shall take a northern route. We shall pass under the northern regions of Europe, Sweden, Russia, Siberia, and who knows where, instead of burying ourselves under the burning plains and deserts of Africa. Let us go on as we're going, and heaven will be our guide. Yes, Harry, yes. We shall leave the flat sea behind us, and we shall descend, descend, forever descend. <laughs> Do you know, my dear boy, that to reach the center of the earth, we have only another 5,000 miles to travel? Oh, 5,000? It's scarcely worth talking about. The thing is to get going. Yes, yes, to get going. Forward to the center of the earth. Thus, our wild speeches continued until we rejoined our patient and phlegmatic guide. All was ready for our departure. Every single package and parcel was stowed in its allotted place. We boarded the raft and hoisted the sail, and hence guided our frail craft towards the newly named Cape Sacknesem. About six o'clock in the evening, we sighted a suitable place to land. I was the first to leap ashore. My uncle and Hans followed more sedately. I was still terribly excited and anxious to make a start without any further delay. For once in a way, my uncle was more prudent. My dear boy, I am as anxious as you are to make a start. But before we do anything else, let us survey the mysterious gallery which marks the beginning of our road. Then we can decide if we need to prepare and mend our ladder. The professor set about testing our Rumkoff's coil, which would soon be needed to provide us with light in the galleries. While he was doing so, Hans hitched the raft to a projecting rock scarcely 20 paces distant from the gallery. At length, my uncle declared that he was ready, and we advanced in single file, myself in the lead. The opening to the gallery was circular, about five feet in diameter. The floor was roughly at water level, and we were able to enter it without hindrance. As we went forward, I counted my steps into the tunnel. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. T go on, Harry. What's stopping you? I can't go on. Why not? Why not? The way is blocked. This confounded stone. Hmm? Solid granite. A block of solid granite. Is there no way around it? None. Or beneath? No. Or above? No. Is there no sign of another opening to right or left? Nothing, Uncle. Nothing at all. This is intolerable. Intolerable. Why? Why is the stone here? It has no business here. This is our proper road, I am convinced. Am I right? I do not understand this. What? 
What about Arna Sacknessem, Uncle? Huh? What about Arna Sacknessem? Do you imagine... You're right, my boy. Sacknessem penetrated to the center of the earth. He can never have been checked by a block of stone. Of course he wasn't. No. At one time, this passage was quite clear. You can tell that by the smoothness of the walls. Hmm. But sometime or other, there's been an earthquake which brought down this solid granite wall. I'll wager it wasn't here when Sacknessem passed this way, and what I say is this. If we don't smash it down somehow or other, we're not worthy to follow Sacknessem. We don't even deserve to reach the center of the earth. Oh, Harry, let us get to work with pickaxes and crowbar. Hans, the tools, fetch the tools from the rock. A moment. If we work a thousand years, we shall never shift this rock with pickaxes. Yeah. What then? What then? There is another way. We can blast the rock to smithereens. Gunpowder. Yes. To work. To work. <laughs> Installment of A Journey to the Center of the Earth, adapted by Howard Jones from the novel by Jules Verne. The cast was as follows Harry Lawson was played by Bernard Horsfall and Professor von Hardwick by Geoffrey Banks. And it was produced in the north of England by Trevor Hill. We invite you to listen to the eighth and the final installment of this serial next Thursday at 5.25 on this service, Radio 4.